Hey everyone, welcome to Can't Afford to Record, the YouTube channel where we figure out the art of audio production together. And today we're talking with mixing engineer, producer and drummer Carl Barner. Carl embraced modern technology for remote mixing and collaboration early on when he had an inkling that this is kind of the way that things are heading. And as we know, they did. You're going to finish this episode today ready to take on your dreams with audio production because Carl just has this way about him that just helps you bring better focus to what you're doing. Not only that, but myself, after reading the beta version of his course, well, I'm very inspired and you will be too. Big thank you to Carl for speaking with me today. I hope you enjoy this episode and be sure to check out the audio version on Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. Now, on with the episode. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are with Carl Barner. How are you doing, Carl? I am doing fantastically. How are you? I'm really good. You're in Philly? Uh, I'm about an hour west of Philly. Yeah, okay. in a little city called Lancaster. Lancaster. Okay. And, and what, what is, what's Lancaster like? What's, what's, that, what's your surroundings like? Honestly, I love it here. It's kind of weird. Um, so it, it took some convincing from my wife for me to move out here because we lived in philly for a long time mm -hmm. and i knew it was kind of like a cool little city but never really spent much time there but what, what i've come to learn and which is kind of why it's so cool is don't quote me on this whoever's watching or listening <laughs> um there was an article a couple years ago in the bbc actually about lancaster and how it has the highest per capita refugee intake in all of the u.s and it was something something crazy, like 20 times the national average for cities. So the food culture here is bonkers. It's it's so cool. It's such a and it's we're in the middle of like Amish country. So there are like horse and buggies everywhere. And it's this weird, very rural, very conservative like county. And then the city is like this very hip like vibrant yeah. vibrant multicultural oasis it's kind of it's it's bizarre so i always joke that if i go five minutes in one direction from my house i'm on an amish dairy getting the grossest but delicious and well, i guess gross in an unhealthy way uh lunch meat uh, imaginable but then i go five minutes in the opposite direction and i'm getting the best nepali food i've ever had yeah you know it's such a awesome. such a cool spot you know the we got, we bought a house here in 2018, sort of like a great school district. It's great. The music scene is very metal centric. There's a lot of metal, a lot of, a lot of metal, a lot of rap and a lot of like Americana folky stuff. None of which I do that much of, which was part of the reason I think why thankfully I started venturing into doing remote work mm -hmm. as early as I did because it was kind of out of necessity because there was nobody here really or not many people here doing the kind of stuff that I was stoked about right and all things that we're going to get into as well today I'm really really excited um so a question that I do kick off every interview with although not this one because I've just learned about Lancaster and all the wonderful food that you have there you can, you um, can edit this and, and move it later no I love it we, we'll keep it as it is um but it, my, my first question is, do you remember a time you couldn't afford to record? Yes. And how was that? And, and how did you navigate it? Um, I feel like I still kind of navigate it sometimes. You know, I could, I could take that kind, of, uh, that kind of approach to it and say that depending on the project, sometimes just out of necessity, we have to do things uh, on a lower budget than, than other times. Like... Uh, like even like yesterday i released like an instagram video that i made where i just recorded all the drums using my iphone my iphone mic so technically like i i have other stuff here and i could have done it that way but i still like the challenge of recording with you know without great gear because i feel like it, it forces you to think creatively and problem solve so that said like i think a lot of my learning you know, learning production skills and and tracking skills and engineering skills, and even from a performance standpoint as a session drummer, 
I feel like I've always been able to make the most out of what I have, or I've been, for, I've been forced to make the most out of what I have, which has then become me being able to do so. I guess mm -hmm. I have a lot of practice at that. It's the limitations, isn't it? Um, and also yeah. maybe not knowing better uh, at the time of only having one microphone um, when you first start out and I'm going to move this and hopefully I get a different sound this take or whatever it might be. And yeah, the, the, or, or the, opposite, the opposite when the mic moves and you don't realize it and they're trying to figure out, well, why does this sound different? What happened? And then you look over and you realize, oh, it, the guitarist bumped it off the guitar amp and now it's laying on the floor. Mm -hmm. you know, so even, even those kind of situations where something goes wrong and you can learn from that and become more aware of it yeah. for the next round. Or it goes right. And that was the take. Exactly. There were, <laughs> you know, here's, here's a good story for this. Mm. So my old band, Cheerleader, we went out to LA to do our first like, full-length album. And we were over at East West and this like ridiculous, ridiculous studio. Um, we were working with Mark Needham, who's a phenomenal producer and mix engineer. And like the room, the, the room that we were in, I think Lincoln Park was in there the day before us. And like Snoop, the one day Snoop Dogg was in like the room next to us. And it was like this, you know, absurdly nice, you know, studio with a ton of history. And I remember that for the main single off of our, our album, the verses, well, all the vocals were recorded on these, you know, like literally $20,000 microphones. They were some like crazy, like gold plated, huge things. And it sounded fantastic, but there was just something about the performance that after everything was recorded, our singer just wasn't really happy with. And we ended up, he ended up coming over to my house and we recorded the vocals for the verses on like a $200 AKG mic. And those are the ones that actually ended up on the record. So it's like the, the verse, and there's honestly the crazy part, and this is definitely due to the fact that Mark is a phenomenal producer and engineer. It's you can't really tell the difference. You know, like it's almost when it goes from like the verse and pre chorus into the chorus, like you can't tell that the microphone choice jumped in price exponentially. Yeah. From section to section. And I think that was one of the big moments in my career when I realized that the performance, like if the performance is right, it doesn't matter what the mic is. And if the performance is not right, it doesn't matter what the mic is. Man, you're speaking my language. Um, it, it really, and, and this is stuff I feel like, we, you know, I'm sure you have to do the same, but we have to remind ourselves all the time of is you can so easily fall into the, there's no way I can continue my career if I don't have this microphone or if I don't have this plugin. We do that so often where it's like, do I need another SSL channel strip plugin? Or can I just <laughs> use the one that I bought? <laughs> another another good example. Let's see if I move my camera. Okay. I have a big old analog console over here. That it's a like late '80s KDAC console. This specific one, like this this unit, was used on the Lion King on Broadway and the producers on Broadway. And I still have the. Uh, the Pumba sticker that I used to run like my kick drum through. Now, my my good friend Tom was long term babysitting that for probably I think probably from 2017 until this like a couple months ago, and he brought it back and it's been sitting there, not being used. I don't even, I don't even have it plugged in because what I actually use every day is. my Apollo twin, you know? So like, I actually, it's, it's funny because I even sold my other interfaces. So like, I, even if I wanted to use that, I couldn't because I have two inputs. Right. You know? So, and, and I, that's honestly part of the reason that I, part of the reason why I film things in here, like social media content, 
uh, the reason that I film them at the angles that I film them at is because I want to make sure that that is not in the shot. Right. Which I feel like is probably counterintuitive to most engineers that if they have a console, they want that in every single photo because that's the cool centerpiece. And for me, I'm like kind of embarrassed by it <laughs> because it's overkill. It's complete yeah. overkill. If I'm tracking anything, I'm going somewhere else. Like I have a full studio, but if I'm tracking drums, I'm going, I like, I want to go to somebody else's room because I want to be the one playing the drums or I want to be the one in producer mode. I don't want to be engineering and I don't want to bring somebody else in here to engineer in a room that they're not familiar with. I'd rather go to them, let them work in their elements. So that way all of the best possible decision-making is being done. Right. So yeah. So that's a, it's a, a prime example. Yeah. You prime could, example. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I mean, I, I, I would love, you know, it's hard. I'm trying to think of a way to transition into your networking and the, the stuff you really focus on now. I've been, and I was thinking about this today, like, how do I, how can I hit also hit on the other points that I want to hit on? But, you know, I really want to get into this. So maybe we just jump straight into the deep. I'm going to say the best way to make it, <laughs> best way to make a really abrupt uh, transition and conversation is to talk out loud about the difficulty of finding a smooth way to transition. So you you nailed it. And That's it. well, I'm glad you recognized it. Uh, yeah. Now we're here. Now, now we can talk, <laughs> about <laughs> talk about all of that. Yeah. There you go. I, I thought I'm, I would maybe just sort of uh, go into this with a, with a bit of an example and a, maybe a slight success story on my end. Um, which hopefully resonates with everything you do. Um, and I kind of went through this before I actually discovered what you do and, um, you know, your course and all that wonderful stuff. Um, because I have a mentor and, you know, it, I, in when the pandemic really kicked into place, um, my live playing and, uh, you know, the touring stuff really, really dried up as it did for everyone. This isn't anything new. But I just wasn't willing to wait around for it to come back. And I was like, okay, well, I'm, I like I like mixing and recording and dabbling. I'm going to go all in. And so I did. And that's how the channel started and so forth. And I just enjoyed it so much over the, the next couple of years. That I was like, no, actually, I think this is what I want to keep doing now. Um, and so I got myself a mentor. And um, he was like, you know, you should really go and think about your network. Go and see what you got you know, go and make some old connections and, um, you know, see if you can get those happening again. So I reached out to a bunch of people, you know, people that I really respect. And this one person in particular, um, I hadn't spoken to them for a while. And so I went on their Spotify and I saw 7,000 monthly listeners or something like that. And I was like, oh boy, Okay. Well, and I closed out of the app. I was like, well, no, well, it doesn't matter. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll go and look for some, some other, you know, see, see what else I can do and what other things. And then I was like, no, nah, screw it. I'm just going to reach out to them anyway. I really like their music and I think I should. Yeah. And so I did. And to my surprise, they got back in touch with me, not, not too uh, long after and basically said, you cannot have sent this at a better time. I was just speaking to someone about how I would love to find a new producer to work with um, and and just sort of have a bit more freedom in the music that I'm creating. And I would love to speak to you more about this. So now fast forward on today, we're, we've just actually, I just had the email back and the, the sign off on the second song we've just finished together. And um, I, I nearly didn't, I nearly didn't reach out. Mm -hmm. And from reading your course and you know, listening to the stuff you do, it's just been also validating that I'm, I'm doing the right thing or I'm on the right path. Yeah. I feel like your course, I am the absolute prime example for, I'm like the target audience and it's, it's, it's just been really cool. So I just wanted to like sort of publicly say thank you for, you know, you know, validating a, a lot of these ideas and uh, from reading your courses, given me loads of new ideas as well and things that I can't wait to put into, you know, into the future but i guess after all this and what i'm trying to say because i'm i've made this about me and that's not what it's about but um what i know you have to give it a name and the cold outreach thing can you know it has to, you know i know you've given it that name but it, it also doesn't feel like it is cold outreach because you're 
you're reaching out to people that you either know or you respect or you love their music that yeah. is what comes first it, yeah so yeah i think for so for any of the viewers listeners that aren't familiar with with the chorus because it's not even out yet um S sorry if i uh, i was a uh, i was a little premature sorry <laughs> oh that's okay um uh the the short version is that i've been honestly over the past like 10 months now been developing this course just about you know really building your confidence in your own ability to reach out to and connect with and work with the people that are making the kinds of music that you really are passionate about and also with people that you just really are on the same page with like that's super 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 important and i feel like it's been a centerpiece of my philosophy for quite a while and i feel like that's one of the things that i i believe has helped me to be as successful as i've as i've been um and focusing on building like real relationships with clients rather than just trying to get as many people in the door as possible you know so i'm it, the course is not about marketing it's not about you know anything that's it's not about ads if anything it's kind of anti ads um for most contexts but it's really about you know def defining and refining and then defining again i guess uh who your ideal client is and who do you want to be working with and what not just musically but personality wise like are they super sarcastic are they pretty dry are they super high energy are they really mellow you know all those different things that we very rarely take into consideration when we're you know talking to a potential client or on the other side when we're talking to a potential producer that we want to hire or a mix engineer that we want to hire and i feel like when something that i thankfully realized pretty early on is that the service of for me being a mixing engineer the service that the service itself, the actual mix itself, and like the deliverables is a fairly small part of the overall experience that the customer has. And a very small part of what, whether or not they realize it, the things that they are going to be making their decisions about of whether they're happy with the experience, whether they want to work with me again, whether they want to, you know, shout my name from the rooftops to all their friends. Um, so the course is m more about finding those types of people so that way, you're doing music that you're really passionate about with people that you really get along with and therefore are you're able to better serve them and they're also going to be more likely to want to work with you more and they generally their friends are going to probably be probably be fairly similar blah, 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 blah. their friends are you can edit that part out <laughs> and also their friends are probably going to be kind of similarly minded in in some ways as they are so the people that they refer to you are very likely also going to be people that you would get along with i feel like you've you've come from this in a way that isn't actually about music or mixing at all it's about just being a cool person and and a life and, and just how you treat other people um you know you you just kind of want to have that approach of even if you meet someone new you know, you kind of want that person to be like, oh, I, you know, I met Carl the other day, really, really nice guy. You know, it's, it's, it's not really any different. It's kind of how you want to create relationships in general. Yeah. I mean, I, I learned early on as a session drummer that, and I used to, I tell all of my students this too, or like my drum students, especially, I would tell them this all the time. Like when I would be considered for a gig, right? Whether it's playing live or in the studio, at any given time, there are going to be a thousand other drummers that could play the song as well as me, if not better than me. But I want to also be the person that they want to have in the van with them for weeks at a time. I want to be the one that they want to have in the room to just make sure that the, the session is positive and is, is fun and exciting and productive. So as a session drummer, my drumming like yeah it was kind of like it was important but that was almost like a bare minimum if you really want to think about it but the 
the way that I handled myself in the sessions, the way that I interacted with everybody else in, in the sessions, the way that I respected people, like that's really what what brought me, what what made them want to bring me in and want them to bring me back. You know, and it's all these all kind of those soft skills that are beyond just play drum real fast, play drum real fast, play drum real fast. Do you feel like you learned that from someone? You know, that that sort of learning about the hang, learning about just being a nice person and getting on with people, or was that something that you was natural to you? I I don't I don't remember learning that from somebody, but I do remember plenty of times where there were session players that were brought in that or like or band members of the projects I was playing for where I don't know if I can if I'm allowed to swear on here if you'll you edit can. it. You can. You absolutely can. Like where the people like they might be so technically gifted and just such great players but are just like a fucking nightmare to be in the room with. You know, whether it's the, an ego thing or they're terrible at communicating or they always show up late or they're just like, you know, confrontational about stuff unnecessarily or they're distracted on their phones all the time. You know, so I, I don't think I ever learned like, oh, this is how you should act in the session. But I definitely learned a lot about how I should not act while in the right. session. right. So I think the cumulative uh, pile of awful things I've seen people do, that was the big teacher for me. Yeah. You, you talk a lot about in, in, uh, in, in the course about how it's about finding stuff that you're into, because then you're going to, you're going to deliver on the best thing. You're going to, you know, yeah. you're going to make something, you're going to be into it. You're going to make it sound great. You're going to want to work with this person and you're going to just do the best job. And but you're also, you know, you, you do say it's, but it's okay to visit other stuff. It's okay to, you know, stop at the, stop at the gas station and stretch your legs a little bit. Um, exactly. I, and I, I, the way I describe it is that going like the purpose of going on a long road trip with your friends is not just to get to the destination. It's for like the journey there. Right. So if you don't stop at some of the little, you know, world's largest ball of yarn, or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> like you need those things to, to, as, you know, musically, it could be like a learning experience of doing a, a type of like a style of music that you've never done before. Or it could be something where maybe you're, you, you don't generally do vocal tuning, but you're tuning vocals for this project. Or, or maybe it's like you're doing an audiobook just because it's something new and it's a chance to learn. I think those are very, very healthy. But as far as the, I like to say that as, as long as I'm putting my gas or putting my foot on the gas pedal, I want to make sure that I'm going in the direction that I want to be going. So when things come to me, when those, when those roadside attractions, you know, kind of present themselves to me, if it looks like something fun or it looks like I'm going to learn from it, even if it isn't directly in line with what my goals are, then I'm usually pretty open to doing it. Assuming the people are cool. Right. right? Exactly. But I'm not going to actively plan my road trip around those around making sure that I stop at every roadside attraction on the way, you know, mm -hmm. like those, it's like, I want to make sure what I'm, when I'm driving, I'm going towards the goal generally, mm -hmm. you know, any proactive energy that I put into trying to start relationships with clients, like when I'm like starting conversations with them, I'm making sure that I'm always focused on like, I think this person's cool. Or I, I, have a, I have a feeling this person might be cool. Their music's definitely great. Let's have a conversation and let's just see, see what they're like. And then if a, I don't know, disco polka project, you know, fi finds their way into my email inbox, I'd probably say yes, just because that sounds awesome. So if any of your listeners have a disco polka project, please. Well, it just so happens that I've actually been working on a track. <laughs> <laughs> like abba with banjos yeah yeah i i feel like if you'd asked me two years ago what is what is it you want to mix for the rest of your life i would have said rock or pop rock i'm a huge fan of like the power pop you know keyboard rock that kind of stuff what it turns out is that i've really enjoyed mixing the acoustic indie mumford and sons kind of stuff 
Uh, and I never thought I would. And I'm not saying that I'm like, I'm good at it. I, I just have enjoyed it. And I feel like some of my good mixes have, have, have come from that genre. So it's a little bit like, oh, okay. I never thought I would have done this. Yeah. And those that's when you say yes to those little roadside attractions and they surprise you. Yeah. And you realize, oh, I really, I really love doing this. I never thought I would. Or I'm surprisingly really good at this. Mm. And I like it. You know, now you can be good at something and not enjoy doing it. Right. I feel like a lot of probably a lot of engineers and producers listening could maybe feel that in their bones. Yeah. There could be a certain style of music that like, yeah, they they can do a really good job at it, but they just hate doing it. You know, like I, I, I know, I mean, that, that's and that, that's the, the whole the whole reason behind the course really ultimately is for you to be able to wake up in the morning excited about the projects that are on your calendar for the day. Yeah. And not be in a situation where you've said yes to, or worse, sought out projects that you know you're not going to be excited about because you were just looking for the money. Yeah. And that was a lot harder to do even three years ago, mm -hmm. you know, but with like the one that kind of silver lining of the whole pandemic was that it's made, you know, it's made Zoom a household name. It's made remote collaboration so much easier, you know, and with technology getting better and better and cheaper and cheaper, it's so much more easily accessible for artists to be able to make music at home. And now it's even easier for somebody in Amish country to be able to work with people in Australia you know, so you don't have to be in LA anymore. You don't you know? you really um, don't. This person that I'm, I've just finished this track with, they're in Italy, you know, and they, they've got a USB mic and, <laughs> and they make it work. And, um, yeah, I just, it's very, uh, yeah, I keep coming back to the word. It's very validating. It's like, oh, okay. This is actually possible. We can yeah. do this. Yeah. Um, so I guess sort of going off that. And maybe you can help me with this a little bit and maybe this will answer a few other questions for, for other people it's wonderful when we find an artist that we're super into we love their songs and they have a daw and they know how to click record great the barrier that i have right now is when i might find someone that i really want to work with they're more than willing to or that they they've got experience about going into a recording studio not that I'm trying to poach and I know you speak very, very well about this, not trying to poach that work at all, but most studios, the person recording it is wearing all the hats and was also mixing it. So what I'm kind of struggling right now is, you know, how do I work with these people that are willing to record in a really nice studio, um, but then give me the tracks and have me mix it. I'm trying to find a good way to navigate that. So um, just to make sure that I understand. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to give you my, like what I would do and what I have done. Mm. Um, and, and I still do kind of regularly. And then you tell me if I'm on, on the right track, if I'm understanding you correctly, but like I've had artists where they typically would go into a studio, um, but want me to, to mix them or maybe I'm doing some production or, for me, the, probably the most common is they'll come to me for a full production, but I bring in co-producers and I have somebody else that maybe knows that style of music way more than I do to take the reins of the production and arrangement side of things and then kind of pass the baton to me when it's ready for mixing. So what I would do is tell the artist, hey, like I want you to record. If you want to record vocals in a real studio, I will happily coordinate with that studio to make sure that they have everything that they need. They know the schedule they, or they have like, they have all the files that they possibly need. They kind of know what we're trying to achieve. I can take your, you know, iPhone demos, your iPhone vocals, if I need to, and plot out essentially a to-do list for them where they know, okay, well, we need to do the lead vocal for the whole song. And then we're going to do doubles of, the choruses and these particular harmonies here, whatever. So that way the studio knows exactly what we need. And 
especially if it's something where we offer to take the reins on that communication, then I don't think I've ever had anybody try to steal the client from me. You know what I mean? Like I don't have any fear of working, of, of helping and facilitating an artist to work with a studio that's local to them because maybe it's just my confidence. Maybe it's a confidence thing. Maybe it's like a, a blind confidence thing where I'm like, no, they're not going to want to leave. They're not going to want to leave me. Why would they want to leave me? But I guess because I try to make the experience so good for them and try to be as helpful as I can, then it would take a lot for them to want to not work with me. Mm -hmm. cool. this, so, so yeah, so it would be a matter of trying to say, hey, I will help coordinate with this. Like, I think I want to support you going to this person for this part of the process. And we can work on the, the demo up until that point. You go in, record your vocals, and I'll coordinate with them to have them send me the session or send me the the individual audio files. And then I can kind of pick back up where we left off. That's how I would handle it. Does that answer the question? It, it, it really, really does. You did an absolutely fantastic job about um, uh, answering that question. I think even as you were explaining it, I was like, oh, yeah, I've perhaps been looking at this all wrong i guess my where i'm coming from is like oh i you know i want to mix more i want to mix more but how do i get those mixes when people are willing to go to a recording studio and then it all sort of happens in-house how can i be a part of that project i guess but I'll then here the i have to be the be the foreman on the project you know but, just be like hey, just say hey and if anything the the studio is going to see you as a collaborator and as somebody that's like trying to help them get work. I'm bringing work in, yeah. I'm bringing yeah. work to you, yeah. you know? No, and it's having that producer, it's really a case of, okay, if I want to mix this song, well, actually, why? it's not about being the mixer on this song. It's about, if obviously, if the artist is open to it, it's about being the producer on this song and, yeah, helping everything get pulled together and, and making the bigger thing come a part of it. Yeah. And it's taking on the the producer definition that's more traditional of like project manager. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, you enjoy know, that job? I love it. I honestly love it. I, I love like all, all of my, like pretty much any song that I work on, the vast majority of them have a team of at least, at least three people on it. Um, whether it's like my assistant, myself and like a mastering engineer um, or also co-producers or session musicians. But I just love, I love being the, the, the dot connector, you know, and helping to find people and putting together the most badass team I possibly can for each song. Mm -hmm. You know, so like there's, there's an artist I'm working with right now that's based out of uh, Sydney, Australia. And I was, he, he sent me the logic demo and I've been like de developing it and kind of replacing some parts. And now he's singing and playing some of the guitars and bass. And then I had my assistant was actually playing some guitar on it as well. Sent it down to my buddy in Austin, Texas to play piano. We're getting a cellist from Nashville to do it, um, to do some, some cello. And then my buddy in LA has a Mellotron. I'm going to add some Mellotron to it. And then after I'm done mixing it, I'm going to send it off to the mastering engineer in Melbourne. So even though it's also in Australia, um, totally different parts. So that's just like, a Tuesday for me. And I love that. I love that that has become such a normal part of my like work that I think that's, that's really why I get so excited to, to wake up in the morning and work on projects because I get to just talk to all these badass <laughs> musicians and engineers and producers. And it's, I, I'm, I'm not just a one man, you know, one-stop shop. And uh, I'm presuming it's it's like you have this team, but actually you're also a part of, you know, a team that goes in another direction and so oh, yeah. that it, it all crosses oh, the absolutely. path. Yeah. I just, just before this call, I had a call with my, my buddy Tyler and I'm hiring him to play, to, to do some like synth sound design for a project that I'm working on. And he's linking me with uh, one of his artists he's producing that wants to have me mix it. So it's like, I'm hiring him and then like they're hiring me and it's just like whatever different roles we can fulfill whatever whatever particular things we're just the best at we do and mm -hmm. we fill in all those gaps with whoever we feel is like the best at that particular thing whether it's 
mixing, even if it's just like mixing in a certain style or mastering in a certain style or guitar, you know, the number of guitar, different guitar players or even drummers. I've, I've been a session drummer for a long time. I, the, the bulk of my career, like if you do the math, the bulk of my career was as a session drummer. I hire other drummers fairly regularly for recording sessions mm-hmm. as if for certain styles and for certain vibes, they're just better at it than I am. And I feel like once I became okay with that, that just opened up, that opened up every door for me. That's just made life, made the job so much easier. And I can do the ridiculous quantity of projects that I do and not get burned out by it. And it also keeps a good, you know, we've all, we all know how, you know, how many sleepless nights we can have from mixing or working on our own performances or our own songs. And if you're able to hand that drummer, hand that drum gig off to someone else and still, you know, you're still so involved in the song, but you're still disconnected that you can see the performance from a different uh, angle, I suppose. I can, I can stay as like objectivity is huge. So Mm -hmm. I can try to stay as objective as I can. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, in your course, you use really, really wonderful analogies. Um, some that really stood out to me, um, or one that really stood out to me, uh, is a gold prospector wouldn't sift through the same scoop of dirt over and over. There comes a point when you realize, ah, there's no gold in this scoop, and you try the next. If you're consistent and open, you'll eventually find your gold. Um, that's just one of some, you know, just things that really hit home to me um how important are analogies for you um to get things across to people so you know when you watch when you're a kid and watch cartoons there was this kind of trope where there would be like three raccoons like standing on each other's shoulders in a trench coat and they pretend to be a real person Mm -hmm. i'm just a whole bunch of analogies stacked up and wearing a trench coat pretending to be a person (laughs) so i i that's, you know, I, I've been been teaching for 17 years now mm-hmm. in various capacities. And that's just something that I think I developed as a way of trying to explain concepts to so many different types of people. So I could take mm-hmm. the same, take any any concept, whether it's something specific with, with drumming or it was with mixing or performance or whatever. And if I'm trying to explain that same core idea to you know, 30 different people that have 30 different ways of learning, 30 different sets of experiences, 30 different sets of interests. Mm -hmm. And just explaining it from a purely technical standpoint isn't ever going to work. But if I can find ways to explain it in a different way that may actually connect with them and make them understand it more, then that is something that has always been able, has always enabled me to more effectively communicate the concept. And kind of yeah. putting it into those terms. Uh, so, yeah, I use them all the time. All well, the and time. It's, you've made it really accessible. Um, for someone like me, I really am not very good at reading. Um, I definitely struggle with mild dyslexia. And so um, I don't enjoy reading. But when I was reading your course, it felt so different. And I was just really intrigued to... Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, it, it, it was it was just really fun. It was super, super fun to read. And uh, it was nice because I feel like we both come from the same perspective. I teach a lot of guitar um, remotely as well, which, you know, is uh, has obviously increased over the past couple of years. It's all remote now, actually. I don't do any in-person stuff anymore. But um, I had to come up with a way as well of something. Not everyone learns the same way. Not everyone can read off you know, a whiteboard at school and understand it like it's going to be done like that. Um, and uh, like I had one the other day and sometimes you think about them on the spot, don't you? And then all of a sudden you're like, ah, that's it now. Like this yeah. is the way I explain this. But oh, I, yeah. just, I had a student that, you know, I, 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 it, it doesn't really matter what genre it was, but they were like, well, I'm thinking about, you know, getting into jazz. And I was like, okay, well, do you listen to jazz? And they were like, well, no, not really. So like, okay, well, you need to go and listen to jazz so you know first of all it's a little bit like if you wanted to you know paint a picture or you know paint a mountain picture you know beautiful bob ross type picture or something like that 
it's hard to do that just from your head sometimes. But if you had a, a, a postcard in front of you, I bet you would do a better job of it because you have something to reference. You've got something yeah. to lean on. Um, and yeah, it's, it's those little analogies that you come up with that just really help with your teaching and get things across differently to people. Yeah. Um, and so I really appreciated all the stuff that you put in your course for that because it just made it, yeah, just really, yeah, worked for me. Um, Can I tell you one that I came up with today earlier? Yes, absolutely. Maybe about it. <laughs> uh, so in the States, we have this place called, and I, I don't know if they're still around, but it was called Chuck E. Cheese's. Okay. And it, okay. And it was like a an indoor, like arcade thing for kids with right? like with uh moving like yeah with like anim animatronics Animatro yeah. animals and things yeah okay so uh when you go there you know all of the food is it's like going to the movie theater where all the food is just like crazy expensive because they know that the kids are everyone's going to want to order it that's how they make their money so when you order a pizza there or at least this is when i was a kid when you'd order a pizza it would be you know three times the price of a pizza at any other shop. It'd be a little bit bigger than a normal pizza, but they would cut it into these like comically small sizes, right? They would take a single pizza and instead of it being in like six slices or eight slices, it would be like 20 slices, like the tiniest little things, which makes sense because you're giving it to a whole bunch of little kids, right? Right. Otherwise, like the kids are just going to like eat three bites and then abandon, you know, $10 worth of pizza. So... The analogy that I use that for today, um, I was talking with a client of mine that I'm mixing and we were on a Zoom call trying to figure out how to handle this one particular section because there was just too many things going on. It was very a very like maximalist part of the production and it was getting to the point where he was like, okay, can you turn this thing up? Okay, well, now I can't hear this. Can you turn that up? Oh, well, now I can't hear this. Can you turn that up? And what I said was that you know the speakers are like a the, the 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 speakers when you're listening to music it's like a pizza and if there's four things going on it's like cutting a pizza into four slices if there's 20 things going on it's like you know cutting that pizza into 20 slices so if you want something if you want one of those you know characters in your song to have a bigger slice of pizza it's got to come from somewhere. They can't get more pizza. There's only, there's a finite amount of pizza. So you have to figure out, well, who's like, what do we need to remove to make room for, mm. for this part? And that's why I was, I was like trying to say, like, when you listen to like a good example that I always use in this case is uh, in the conversation or in the context of loudness, right. And trying to have like big, full loud mixes. And one of the, easy ways to get something to sound loud is to have it be very minimal because there's just not a lot of stuff fighting for for sound and also then your transients are more pronounced there's a whole bunch of stuff but i always say like if you listen to kanye west's black skinhead there's not a lot of things going on it's a very 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 minimal production and it is loud as shit and there's just so few things so every every element in that song is getting a gigantic slice of pizza mm -hmm. Right. So I started to use that. Now I'm going to just use it all the time when I'm talking about like, Hey, you get, there's too many things going on. You know, you got one, you only have one, one pizza. Like we got to figure out, maybe get rid of some of these characters so that each one has a little bit more yeah. to eat. It's great. You should, that's a great way to explain it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm very, uh, aware of that. I don't want to take up too much of your time today. Um, but Something I kind of hoped we could touch on, if you're willing, is... Um, as, much time, as much time as you need. Okay, awesome. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about imposter syndrome? And um, can you just figure it out for everyone right now? Can you just give us the one answer that just, you know, stops it all completely? <laughs> this is the podcast it happens on. <laughs> um, the only surefire remedy for imposter syndrome is death. Yeah. I was I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> I think that's you know, the only the only cure for imposter syndrome is is death. Um, no, uh, because you're human with it, I guess. You're only a human, right? You're alive because of it. Yeah, and I would rather 
I would rather have imposter syndrome than be blindly ignorant to my own inabilities. Mm. And and I'd I'd rather I'd rather give myself too little credit than give myself too much credit. Right. So I guess it's a better of two evils mm-hmm. situation. Yeah. Um, but it's real. It's a thing, and it sucks. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> But but I think that's why stories like when you were talking about reaching out to that artist on Spotify, like that's why stories like that are so important. And we need to make sure that we learn from them and remember them because mm-hmm. the reason that you initially didn't reach out was because of imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. Because you're like, who, why, why would they even respond to my message? Yeah. Right? yeah. And now you, you said you've just finished your second song with them. Yeah. So it's, It'll it'll always be there, and I feel like the more that you can come to terms with it and accept that it's going to be a distraction and treat it like a distraction, mm-hmm. rather than treating it like gospel, mm-hmm. I think that's the the healthier way to get through it. You say something really cool um, in the course where it says, um, and and this really resonated with me so much. Um, we crave more than a paycheck we crave a deep connection to the art we're hired to make. And I think that's really why imposter syndrome is a thing is because we are just so passionate about it. I, I really can't imagine working on a song that I love where I'm like, ah, it's good enough. Send it. I can't imagine doing that. You know? Yeah. And I, yeah, it, it's hard. It's really hard. And I feel I struggle with that a long for a long time. Mm-hmm. And that there's always that kind of long running joke meme of the skeleton sitting in front of the console, you know, saying, Oh, just just one, you know, just, just one, one more, more hour. <laughs> just one more hour. You know, because we've all we've all gotten to that point. But I feel like what I what for me, what's helped me is I realized that the more songs I did, like every time I did a new song, I got better. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, oh, well, this song, like this mix is not going to get any better unless I get better. Mm -hmm. So the more songs that I can do, the better each one's going to be. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I went from, like there are some songs that I did before that I easily sunk like a, a, an embarrassingly large amount of time on like like 50 or 60 hours into a mix yeah and now i get m- most mix ones i get out the door in like about two hours wow and i it's not because i'm it's not because i'm just like a better i mean hopefully i'm a better mixer by now but i mean it's, it's not just because I'm i'm better at it but it's also because i realized that the things that were causing the imposter syndrome were those little splitting hairs things that don't actually really impact the song. Mm -hmm. And when I try to put into perspective the decision-making that I do and say, okay, I can make these big macro moves and this may not feel sonically perfect, but it is definitely moving in the right direction. And like, it's, I'm, it's making me dance, even though, yeah, there might be a weird little ring in the tambourine note, whatever. Like it's it's feeling right. That is more important to me now than my ego or my need to feel like I have to have some kind of stamp on the song. Right. And that has enabled me to, I think, be able to let go of things mm-hmm. a lot more quickly because I realized, oh, I can just make big sweeping decisions first and make big impacts on it and then like that yeah i don't know i i just lost it <laughs> no 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 i i totally i totally you're serving the song and and it's and it's what the song needs and that and that's it is th- thank you it's, it's the realization that serving the song is going to feel so much better than serving my own insecurities or serving what your mixer friends would think yeah. Right. I, 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 I think I've definitely have done that where I'm just like, Oh, I wonder when I send this to my buddy, is this going to impress him? Why the heck am I thinking about that? 
they're not your target audience. No. Your target audience, like when you're mixing, your target audience is the person you're mixing for. Yeah. Not your friends, not your like you could you could argue like yeah potential clients in the future that will hear it well yeah duh but like in the moment you want to do what is going to feel like you want to help them to achieve their vision of the song in a way that you also feel like you've given as much integrity to the project as you can yeah yeah and when you can find that point that's when it's that's when it's you know perfect or the close as close to perfect as you can get yeah and it has absolutely. nothing to do with frequencies it has nothing to do with loudness it's all about do you feel like you're serving the song and do they feel like you're serving the song mm -hmm. and if yes then go for it's, it it's great yeah um i feel like we 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 probably come from the same point of view on this but a lot of what can't afford to record was about for me and the channel and the podcast is is, all, is saying it's okay to be vulnerable uh, quite a lot of what time we see on YouTube is the finished result. Like when we watch a mix breakdown, yeah, it's the it's the finished mix breakdown. But it doesn't. We don't see all the plugins they turned off, or or the or the things that didn't work, or the they peaked out the speakers, or you know. So can you think of a time? I know it's this definitely putting you on the spot here. So I, I appreciate that. But can you think of a time when you've, yeah, you've had to be really vulnerable and be like, I got that wrong, and. Uh, you know, this is this is what I changed, or was there maybe an example with a client that um, you really learned something very important from? I honest answer. I don't know of any specific individual times because I feel like that happens so constantly. Mm. This had has happened so constantly throughout my career that. That's like a normal, that, like, I, I look at it this way. I, this not the answer you're expecting, but I feel like if I don't feel that way at least once a day, then I'm probably not doing it right. I'm not, wow. yeah. I'm not, I'm not pushing myself enough. I'm not experimenting myself. If I'm not failing every day, then I'm not trying hard enough. Mm. Which is what happens to everyone. But I feel like with the failures, we just let's put them in the bottom drawer and forget that never happened and focus on on the wins, you know, but oh, it's yeah. allowing yourself to be like, OK, all right. Yeah, I did. It's, it's, it's about learning from that mistake and or not. It's not even a mistake, but just say, OK, this a good, a good probably a good practical example would be something where I am. Maybe I, I soloed. The guitar part mm -hmm. and i was playing with all these plugins and i just got this really awesome tone and it sounds really cool and then i unsolo it and it just sounds like the dumbest thing ever because in context it just doesn't work mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that the skills that i those little micro skills and that little micro knowledge i acquired while experimenting there mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that that's not valuable it's just not applicable to this context mm -hmm. so i try to look at, at those you know, you can call them failures, you can call them mistakes. Like I just look at them as, you know, learning experiences of, oh, this, this is what I chased after this idea. I used this method to try to achieve it. And either I didn't achieve it and could figure out why that didn't achieve it, or I did achieve it and it ended up not actually working and doing what I wanted it to do. But then why? Like what, what was my, my thought process where where along the thought process did i go wrong did i uh, make an assumption that oh if i if i make this verbed out it's gonna be really unique and interesting and i didn't think oh well everything else is already verbed out so now it actually kind of falls back into the wash of everything else because everything is kind of washy now so there's no distinct depth between the the clear parts and the washed out parts you know like it's mm -hmm. If you look at them as opportunities to, you know, further your understanding and your problem solving, then there, there are no mistakes. How much have you gone back over writing this course and changed something? And has this course been written for you or has it been written for other people? Was it a way of thinking out loud for you or typing out loud? Um, the so 
I'd say honestly, the revisions that I made, 99% of the revisions were either formatting revisions or like I could probably say this a little bit more concisely kind of okay. thing right. rather than like I don't and all of the stuff that I talk about it's all stuff that I've I've done and that I do um and it's all based on last summer when I guess because anyone listening or watching has doesn't know who I am and doesn't know any of this but um Basically, I started working remotely back in probably late 2018, beginning of 2019, and had been starting conversations with artists that I really liked and wanted to work with. Uh, but at the time, they just had their, their local studio they wanted to go to, and they just had their thing. And that's totally cool. Um, so by the time COVID hit, I was already about 40%, 50% remote. And... I, I knew that the industry was going to be going in that direction. I just didn't know how immediately and all encompassing <laughs> it was going to be because of the pandemic. But because I was already, you know, about roughly halfway remote anyway, I had all of the, or I had most of the kinks worked out. Mm -hmm. Right. So there was this moment in, it must have been beginning of April 2020, like a couple of weeks after things started shutting down here where all within the span of one week, I had, I think, seven different artists that I had been talking to um, over the past like year and a half up to that point. I'd been talking to them, trying to get them to work with me, not being like, hey, hire me, hire me. I'm going to like try to shake their lunch money out. I've just been like trying to keep up with them, trying to stay top of mind. I had seven different artists that same week reach out to me saying, hey, we can't record with our normal local studio anymore can we like, let's, are you still interested in working? Let's, let's talk about this. And that's when I realized, oh, follow-ups work, staying, you know, staying on top of things work. But then that led to 2020 being, you know, I was, I was full-time since 2009 and 2020 was by far my best financial year ever. Mm -hmm. And almost everybody that I knew probably had their worst year ever. Mm -hmm. And then 2021 was significant, pretty significantly better than 2020 was. And this year I'm on, I'm on pace to be even better than that. But it was around last summer when I was sitting down and trying to think of what was the differentiating factor between mm -hmm. my friends that were really struggling to find mm -hmm. work and and me, because I was clearly like, do, I was doing something right. I just didn't know what it was. And I immediately ruled out, well, I'm a better mixer. Because like, that's not it. Like, as I said earlier on, earlier in the episode, I was saying how the actual service itself is such a small part of it, right? And I realized that it's the way that I do outreach and the way that I'm consistent with it, the way that I do follow-ups, the way that I just really care about the relationships that I build, uh, the way that I make sure that I'm posting about every release that comes out, you know, above and not just like still image of the artwork saying, Hey, I mixed this song for so-and-so go check it out. Like I try to do like a video with, with audio behind it, tagging every person that was involved in it. Like just really trying to show the teamwork and the community and really making that a central, central part of the way that I just do business. And what I was doing was as I started realizing this, I started started writing it out, not necessarily for the purpose of being a course. It was actually just because I was having these conversations with a bunch of my peers and I was just getting tired of telling the same stories. <laughs> you know, so I was I was just like, okay, well, let me write this all out, kind of make it like a little step-by-step -step thing. And that ended up becoming just chapter one. Like I thought it was just going to be this like, the chapter about Spotify and building the mm -hmm. team. And I was like, that's, that's how I do it. This is all you need. And as it was, as it was developing and I started realizing, oh, well, do like finding these artists is like a small part of it, but the greater context really, it's a matter of, well, what do they see when they check me out? What is my website? Like, what's my social media? Like, what's mm -hmm. my portfolio? Like, mm -hmm. how am I, how am I, what, what does my website say? Like, am, is it all about me or is it all about 
my desire to mm. help people? like what's mm-hmm. what kind of impression do they get mm-hmm. because none of these things like like even with outreach because I, I do outreach differently than all of my, my friends did it's like i always say like if outreach if 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 doing outreach is like planting seeds then you know like your social media content and, and those things that's like the fertilizer you're putting on the seeds right yeah so and the follow-ups is also like the fertilizer so the course just kind of kept on growing and developing because these were already things that I was doing. And as I was, the more I was thinking about it, the more I was explaining it to my peers and friends, and the more that I was writing it out, the more clear the ideas were becoming. And the more questions it started to make me ask myself to really Mm -hmm. try to understand not just what I think was working, but what was actually working, kind of digging, digging deeper into that. So that said, like with going back to your question about how much has changed and been revised in the course, not a lot has really changed other than formatting and like maybe trying to do some better wording of things. Like the actual content itself hasn't changed. Mm-hmm. It's just gotten longer. <laughs> I really think a, a word, if I could sum up, you know, what you do and, and, and the course that I've been reading, um, it's the word intention. I think it comes down to it all. Uh, for me, that's what I picked up on it. Are you intentional about your career? First of all, like, are you just, you know, are you intentional that this is, you want to be, you want to mix for the next 20, 30 years? Like is, you know, is, is this the intention? Are you intention, intentional about who you're reaching out to because you like their music? Um, is it coming from a good place? Uh, are you willing, you know, it's something that, that really made me reflect is, are you willing to still listen to that person if they never get back to you? Are you willing to still put on their music? And I was like, that one hit me really hard. I was like, oh, I don't know. I need to think about this. I need to, yeah. It's, there's so much intention every step of the way. And it's just really great. Really, really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, thank you. Thank you. And that's why a lot of the course is about you know, really chapter one is about using Spotify to just find so many artists making the kind of music that you want. And then chapter two is about how to be brutal and disqualify people, Mm -hmm. which is something that I feel like a lot of engineers and producers when they're trying to find clients, like the last thing that they want to do is find a reason not to reach out to somebody. They're like, oh, that's a that's a a body with a pulse. I'm going to reach out to them and see if they want to hire me. Mm -hmm. But I'm very much the opposite where it's like, okay, there is so much music being made and so many songs being released every day that I've, I know that there's more than enough for me to be able to do, you know, a a, a really good full-time living doing this. That's Mm -hmm. no, not a question. So that's the case. I actually can be picky with who I reach out to. Mm -hmm. So chapter, the whole thing of chapter two is just about, you know, figuring out, well, what are some reasons not to reach out to somebody? Mm-hmm. And that's that intention. And it's, it's things like one of the examples I use is there are people on, you know, they're, they might have 4,000 monthly listeners on Spotify, and then they have 600,000 Instagram followers. And every image is, everything is like, just like them sitting on the beach, you know, and that's cool and all, but clearly the music that to me, that's a sign that the music isn't quite as important Mm-hmm. You, or the, the the music might be like secondary to the lifestyle mm-hmm. and that's just not really in line with what i want to do and not really what my goals are so i'm gonna just skip over that mm-hmm. um but again it's, it's com- like you said it's coming down to intention and making sure that when i'm reaching out to somebody it's because i like like i liking their music is a part of it mm-hmm. but it's also like do we just do we vibe like am i going to enjoy talking to this person am i going to enjoy like doing a zoom call to go over mixed revisions or am i going to loathe it and mm-hmm. hope that they get sick so we can reschedule mm-hmm. or i hope, hope i hope i get a flat tire so i have an excuse mm-hmm. to do it you know yeah like, and i i've seen too many i've seen too many producers and engineers and musicians get into situations where they have a very full busy active calendar full of projects that they don't want to do mm-hmm mm-hmm that's 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 hell i don't want that and i i don't want i wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy yeah yeah that's yeah that's like the uh 
the nine to five office job that you yeah know. you you lose the you lose the passion for it yeah yeah man it's it really has been so uh wonderful catching up with you um listening to and and sort of getting to ask you more questions about you know the the course and um get to know you know you a little bit more and and how it started for you but for those who want to find out uh more about carl barner where can they go what can they uh, do to get hold of you um yeah tell us more easiest thing would be to just connect with me on instagram mm -hmm. just at carl bonner i'm sure you can it'll be spelled in the, in the show notes um and if you if it, if it seems like what oh very loud train going by sorry <laughs> Um, if it seems like what we talked about resonates with you, then I would suggest two things. One, I would say three things. One, reach out to me, say hi, let's talk, because I would like talking to people. Uh, two, uh, let me know if you'd want to read the course, because I'm still just giving it to people for free while I'm writing it. Like it'll eventually be, you know, a paid like video course, but right now I'm still until it until I finish it. I'd rather just help people than. Mm -hmm then try to hold as like a secret, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then three, I would say, check out my podcast. Thanks for thinking. Absolutely. It's, it's weird in a good way. It's, I describe it as a combination between a music business. Like if, if a music business podcast had a baby with a guided meditation app, that's kind of how I describe it. And nice. It uh, I like deep questions. I like thinking. I like intentionality, and the podcast is all about that. Yeah, that's so so cool. It's been a real real pleasure, Carl. And um, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for uh, saying yes. And uh, I think we have to do a part two at some point. Please, anytime I think we have to. Yeah, absolutely. So Love that. really appreciate you, and uh, let's catch up soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.